Dr. Bill Harris, welcome to the podcast. You know, we were chatting, I was sharing that a lot of my listeners are very interested and it's their goal to live to 100 and maybe beyond, but it's not just about lifespan, it's about health span. They wanna be healthy along the way. And something mind blowing that I've learned from following your work over the years is that getting enough omega-3s in our diet is a huge part of that. In fact, you've shared previously that people that have higher levels of omega-3s in their blood are less likely to die an earlier death. To me, that's mind blowing. I'd love for you to expand on that. Sure, great to be on your show. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, that particular finding, we, we were uh, part of a large collaboration of a, a bunch of uh, what we call cohort studies. A cohort is just a, just a group of people that gets recruited in a certain area, like in Boston or in London or whatever. And um, the investigators will draw blood samples at the beginning of the study, and then they just keep in, keep in touch with these people over the years to see how they do, what the diseases they develop. And then we look backwards and we look at omega-3 levels in the blood from when they started the study and see what the diseases happened, who died, who didn't die, things like that. So the paper you're talking about, we looked at uh, omega-3 levels in, in something like 150,000 people, 18 different uh, cohorts, uh, and we put it all together and we looked at the people at the highest omega-3 levels, the highest 20% versus the lowest 20%. And those that had the, high, the highest 20% were like 10 to 15% less likely to die during that period of time that we followed them up. You know, I'm, obviously you wait long enough, everybody dies. Okay. So <laughs> just so in, everybody's clear, <laughs> just to be clear on that. Right. We, we are not, this is not immortality we're talking about, but, um, it does seem to make you live on, or higher omega-3 is associated. I have to be careful. I'm not saying the effect of omega-3 is to make you live longer because we haven't done that intervention study, supplementation study, and nobody ever will do that study. But the all, all the evidence is pointing to the association between high, high omega-3 and, and longer life, healthier life, better health span, as you said. You know, that study is the tip of the iceberg, but there's so much more that's there. And in your 40 years of working on this, 40 years plus now, right? 40 years plus now of doing this research, 340 plus papers on omega-3s. Today's interview is really designed to highlight and champion this research to help people understand what I feel I understand, but I want everybody to understand. And you tell me if this is factually correct in the way that I understand it, that when it comes to the most studied nutrients that are out there and their connection with actually moving the needle in improving our health, omega-3 is in the top three or four of those nutrients. Is that correct? That is definitely correct. Yeah, I think if we look at the top nutrients that have had re scientific research papers published on, their, on them, you've got vitamin D, folic acid, and omega-3. And omega three's only been in, in the on the radar since the late seventies, uh, and I'm talking about all the history of medical publications. Okay, back into the 1800s, vitamin D has been known for many, many more years. And so has folic acid. And folic acid got a lot of interest, of course, when it was uh, figured out that it related to um, birth defects. Um, so, it, any event, omega three has gotten a lot of attention, um, and it's it's one of the top three. But one of the top like five molecules in, uh, you know, add aspirin, add uh, prednisone, add uh, other medicines and how much research they've had. Penicillin, it's one of the top five or 10 molecules that's been studied in, in the history of medicine. So therefore, would it be fair to say that if you care about your health, again, this is based on the literature, there's not the causality, there's the association that's there. If you care to live to as long as your genetic potential is designed for, and not just live long, but live a healthy life, you want to seriously be paying attention to omega-3s in the form of getting it regularly in your diet through fish, and then also supplementation. Is that a fair statement? That's, that's a fair statement. That's, that's the reality, right? Uh, fish is a, is a great way to do it. You got to pick the right fish. You got to be consistent with it, um, but it's very doable. I, and but most people will 
not be doing it. <laughs> so they'll take supplements and dietary supplements of omega-3, EPA, DHA are, are definitely fine for increasing your blood levels and your tissue levels. Well, we're going to get into all the details in this interview, but again, just to really drive the message home, I want to bring up another study that you guys were a part of looking at some of this data. And this is something that I wrote about last week in my newsletter. And when I was telling friends about this, their minds literally were blown because they could not imagine how this was possible. You're going to explain to us what might be going on. So I'm glad I'm sitting down. We <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm the unofficial hype person for omega-3 and your research. So that's how excited I am. Okay. Keep it going. So omega-3 is so powerful that even smokers who had the highest level of omega-3 index were actually more protected than non-smokers who had the lowest level of omega-3s in their blood work. Is that accurate? And can you explain what the heck is going on? Yeah, okay. So, right, to, to back up, that's that's a study we did in as part of what's called the Framingham study. It's a big, very famous cohort that a lot of research has been done in. And we looked at the omega-3 levels in the blood of these people. Um, and then we looked at how long they lived, you know, from the time we screened them. I think they're about 65 years old when we screened them when we measured their omega-3 levels. And then we followed them up for about 10 or 12 years. So between say 65 and 75. Some people died, some people didn't, right? Some people were smokers, some people weren't smokers. Uh, and we did all the statistics and found that the people who lived the longest were non-smokers and had the highest omega-3 levels, okay? And contra that, the people who died the soonest, most likely to die, your smokers, and those with the lowest omega-3. And in the middle, I think is the area you're kind of talking about, if you had high omega-3 and were a smoker, you had about the same risk of death as if you were a, a low omega-3 and non-smoker. It's kind of in the middle. So they were roughly equivalent in a way in terms of risk prediction. Now, you know, I, I, I try to be careful with this. I don't, because some people will take this and say, okay, all I got to do is take more, eat more fish, take some fish oil pills, and then the smoking I'm doing right now is not going to bother me. I wouldn't go that far. But we all have some sense of how increase, how much smoking increases your risk for bad outcomes. And I just want to get people to realize that the omega-3 level is kind of in the same category. It's on the other side, of course. Or I guess you'd say a low omega-3 is kind of like being a smoker in terms of your risk. Um, but fair enough, that's a good, good way to explain it. That's fair enough. And you know, I mean, you're a researcher, you work with the team that's there, but you're also a human being. When you came across these findings, was there a party that was like, no freaking way, is this the no actual way. truth? Was there some party that literally like, I keep on using the word mind blown, but this is actually where I feel it's, it's so supposed to be used. Was your mind blown? In these yeah, findings. It, it was. I mean, when I first saw that graph come back from our biostatistics people and showed the, the lines, the death lines, so to speak, and showing that the omega threes basically were so um, basically canceled out the smoking in terms of uh, effect on. I, I was amazed too, but they said trust us, so I trust them. Um, but it's it's a pretty cool finding. It's pretty cool finding, and we're just beginning to peel back the layers of the onion of how powerful omega-3s are. Let's keep the train going a little bit. You sent me some fantastic studies, and I feel like a big part of my job as a podcast host, who's not an expert in health, but is trying to highlight the people who are, like yourself and your team, is that half of my job is just helping people understand the problem and the potential in the first place. Then we can talk about what to do about it, right? But if you don't get how bad the problem is, or if you don't understand the true potential, if I tell you or you tell the audience rather what to do, how much supplements to take, how much fish they should be eating, which we're gonna be covering that, you it comes in this year, you're excited about it for a day, excited about it for a month, you forget about it, and then people move on with their lives. That's why we're taking our time to really tease this out so that people understand. I wanna talk about mental health and brain health for a second. I had mentioned to you that 
I owe so much to your work because growing up being vegetarian and then being vegan for a while and not realizing that I was significantly low in omega-3s, the light bulb moment that I had was doing an omega quant. There was a practitioner and a friend who said, hey, you've been vegan for a little while. Why don't we test you and see, or you could even order this test yourself, which I have the link below. People can go to Omega Quant website. And I did this and it came back and there's this whole phrase that says, test, don't guess. And I was guessing that everything was good, but mentally I wasn't feeling as sharp. I was feeling a little bit of what I would call depressive episodes, even though I wasn't diagnosed. And my omega-3 levels came back significantly low. What do we know about omega-3s and depression or mood? Yeah, it's a great story. And I assume if, if you were a typical vegan, you were below our like 4% in, in that red zone. Um, and that's not a good place to be. What do we know about omega-3 and depression and anxiety? And this is, yeah, there's been quite a bit of research in the area. Um, and it's mixed and part of the blessing is that the mixed blessing of having so many studies done on omega-3 is that some of them turn out like you think they are. Some of them don't really find a relationship or an effect. Um, har hardly ever is there a bad outcome, so to speak. So it's either positive or neutral. Um, but in, in the area of depression, uh, supplementation studies have shown some benefits on increasing uh, or rather de decreasing symptomatology of depression. Uh, those studies can never be really very long. They're not years long, which is what you'd really want. For, for that kind of perspective, we look at blood levels as, as blood levels predicting risk for de developing dementia or I mean depression. Uh, and those typically show higher levels of omega-3 associated with lower risk for developing depression. Okay, that makes sense too. Um, there's been some evidence that EPA might be a little better for depression than DHA, uh, the two long chain omega-3s in fish. Uh, so I mean, we could get into that if you want to, but uh, there's certainly a, a link. I mean, is, is the omega-3 supplementation going to uh, do just as well as an antidepressant? Yeah, maybe not, but we're talking about nutrition here. We're not talking about... And, Usually it helps with the drug, taking them together. Um, but there, there's strong evidence. Um, you know, it, like you said, I'm a scientist and I, I get, I, I try not to get too emotionally <laughs> excited or too, I don't want to speak beyond the data. Um, so I, I, I see, because I'm aware of studies where they didn't see an effect of omega-3. And of course, studies that do see an effect so I have to be a little balanced. Um, and I, the thing is with omega-3, and this goes across the, all of our discussions, is they are completely safe. Completely safe. There is no downside to taking omega-3s. And there's lots and lots and lots of potential upsides, some strongly confirmed, some strongly suggested. Um, but I, when I always look at risk-benefit ratios to, to anything you do in life, if the risk is virtually zero and the benefit is potential and strong, I go, I think it's a favorable ratio. So well, I go for it. Well, that's how I looked at it with myself and seeing that my omega-3 index was so low, I thought, okay, let me start to include fish in my diet. Now this is an N of one personal testimonial, but I try to be transparent with my audience about my own journey and also yeah. tell them that this is an anecdotal testimony, but I'm going to share it anyway. When I started eating fish and supplementing with fish oil, my brain, I felt finally turned on after almost a couple years of it feeling progressively like hmm. I wasn't exactly like my cheerful, upbeat self. That's my own testimony. I have a few other friends that have gone through that. And I look forward to one day, you know, more research that's available, whether it's through your group or you inspiring other people to work on this, where there might be more uh, conclusive results that are there. Yeah, but it, like you said, it, it, what matters is what happens to you. And, exactly, exactly. And, 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 right, and you know, people can try this, and maybe they'll start eating fish and they don't feel any different. Okay, no harm, no foul. Uh, but the odds are it's, it's gonna make a difference and it made a difference, particularly if you start really low like you did. What about Alzheimer's and dementia? 
Do we have any more data that shows a more protective impact on these two very scary diagnoses when it comes to omega-3s? Yeah, we do. And uh, we just published a couple of weeks ago, maybe a, a large study uh, looking at, again, the, what we typically do, omega-3 levels in the blood, DHA, I believe, was our primary focus on that one. Uh, and looked at risk for developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was in a, a large group of people in England. And we, we found the same story we found in other, and others have found too, the highest people with the highest levels of omega-3 at the beginning of the study, which is typically put people in their 50s, 40s or 50s when these studies start. Um, the risk for developing dementia is reduced. And, and you know nobody's gonna prevent Alzheimer's disease. They're not going to prevent dementia. They're going to put it off until you die of something else. That's the best you can ever hope for. Um, the, 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 you know, people talk about preventing the disease. It's, it's not what they what they mean is delaying the disease, and and that's what we all want to do. That's increasing your health span, right? Um, and so the omega threes are certainly strongly linked with a reduced risk for developing them. So. Since we have no treatment, whatever, for these debilitating conditions that we all know about and we all fear more than we fear heart attacks, by and large, uh, definitely take more omega-3 to help reduce your risk for that. That's, that's a no-brainer. Pardon the pun. <laughs> it's the best brainer that you could do. It's, it's, it's the best brainer. <laughs> best brainer. <laughs> if you Good care brain. about your brain health. There you go. Uh, let's go to a few other areas inside of the body and things that people struggle with. High blood pressure is one of those things that so many people struggle with today. Yeah. And there's often um, advice that's given. Okay, you care about your blood pressure, the primary one that's shared with individuals, you know, drinking a lot of water and making sure you're hydrated and also not having too much salt in the diet and sodium in particular. Right. The challenge that I have, the little beef that I have is that with sodium in particular, most of the sodium and, and, and salt that people are getting in their diet is coming from ultra processed food. It's not from the sea salt that we decide to add to a little, you know, great piece of salmon no, that we're no, cook, no. cooking. It's, it's from, hidden. it's hidden. It's bread rolls and these other things that are ultra processed uh, in the diet. But nonetheless, to bring it back to it, lowering blood pressure and the impact of omega-3s. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, in that, that category, the, the studies have looked, the ones that have been uh, most effective have used pretty high intakes of EPA and DHA, maybe three to four grams a day, uh, which is, um, you know, the typical American, just for perspective, typical Americans eating that's not taking a fish oil supplement is getting maybe uh, 0.1 to 0.2 grams a day of EPA DHA, you know, 100, 100 to 200 milligrams a day in their diet. And we're talking about doses here that I just mentioned for blood pressure in the uh, 1,000 to 2,000 milligram a day, which, which is a very easy to get dose, uh, but it's, it's a higher dose than uh, maybe just triglyceride lowering might give you, which we might talk about later. It's, it's doable, it's a minor, it's, it's not a major effect on blood pressure, um, it, it's, a, sign that your blood vessels are healthier, your blood vessels are more compliant, more flexible, um, more able to respond to the heart pushing all that blood out and you don't end up with the high blood pressure. So it, it, it's good for blood pressure as well as a variety of other things we'll, we'll talk about here. Any study that I didn't mention that strongly drives home the evidence around omega-3s and its association with positive outcomes in the body. I'm, I know there's so many to choose from, but if there was one or maybe two that I didn't highlight that really drove it home for the audience, anything that you wanna mention? Yeah, I mean, I think what we hear so much about is inflammation, chronic low-grade inflammation from our diet and our lifestyle and maybe pollution in the air. Um, all these things are, are pushing this, our bodies toward a kind of a chronic inflammatory state. And I think the thing that we've seen with omega-3 is that how do they work, people say, and it's, it's, it's kind of complicated to explain how they work. Uh, it's not like a drug that has just one target and bang, you can say it 
this drug fixes that thing. Omega-3s are in every cell, every cell membrane. Uh, they do good things everywhere. And by about 15 different mechanisms, they do it. Uh, but the the thing that really counts, the, it maybe largely comes down to anti-inflammatory. They are just, they, they put the brakes on, they soften the inflammatory response. And I think that plays out in many, plays out from in dementia, plays out in cardiovascular disease, uh, probably plays out in the, in the way the, um, the, even the blood is a little bit thinner uh, when you take more omega-3. So your blood's less likely to clot in a bad place. That's, that's also part of the good benefits. So inflammation is the one word I would, what, would use to describe all the benefits of omega-3. And we saw that in Framingham in our, our cohort that we looked at. We looked at 10 different blood markers of inflammation, and we correlated those blood markers with the omega-3 level. And for every one of them, higher omega-3, lower inflammatory marker. It's just, it's just been shown so many times, it, it's, uh, it, there's no question about it anymore. Give us a sense of how, and I know you don't like the word deficient, because deficiency implies something incorrect, but give us a sense of how much this key nutrient is missing from our diets, especially here in North America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and because I'm trained in nutrition, in, in nutrition, you learn that to be deficient, there's, there's like being dis deficient in vitamin C. You're, you have scurvy, okay, your teeth fall out. All right, and really bad stuff happens. Uh, vitamin D and rickets, your bones bend and break real easily. Well, deficiency in the omega-3 is not that stark. It's a long-term subtle thing. So I, I'd say insufficiency is a, maybe a little bit better term, but the, in the United States, if we look, ask how many people or what percent are what I would call suboptimal, and optimal, I will say, is an omega-3 index, which we'll talk about, of over 8%. Uh, there we're talking about 90 to 95 percent of people uh, are not it. optimal are not optimal they are but to be not optimal is not necessarily to be deficient it's to be suboptimal you could be better and you could be up in a zone that's uh, protective the average omega-3 level in america is roughly five and a half maybe uh, if you throw it across, we're, we're working on a project right now to kind of define the omega-3 index of every country in the world we can figure out. Um, and America, Canada, United States, we're sort of in that intermediate zone where you're not awful, you're not all vegans, uh, but you're not optimal like the Japanese are, where they're on average, they're 9 or 10% omega-3 index which is great. So I, the, the vast majority of America, people on Western diets, not just Americans, uh, people on, who do not eat fish every day, like some cultures do, Japan, South Korea, um, they have really high omega-3 index because they eat fish a lot. Was there ever a time here, specifically in North America, that you think we were in our more optimal range. If you look at dietary patterns, mm -hmm. you know, excluding out native populations, were we ever at a time where we would be at a much higher omega index? And part of that is asking what have been the factors that have led to us having lower omega threes on average, uh, in our diet? Is it just simply the absence of fish or have we prioritized other things like ultra processed foods that have crowded out a lot of the good things. Yeah, I, I think it's both and. I think you, you definitely the lack of fish in the diet. And, and, you know, historically, there were certainly people on the coasts were, were much more dependent upon the fit on the food that comes right out of the sea because we didn't have refrigeration. We couldn't we couldn't transport things around the country. You had to eat what was there. And there was a lot of fish on the coast. So I suppose, <coughs> excuse me, that omega-3 levels, if we've been able to measure them 100, 200 years ago in coastal populations would have been higher, but not necessarily in South Dakota where I am. <laughs> you know, and I don't really know that we ever were, certainly as a country, high in omega-3. Um, 
people have been tried to raise concerns that omega-6 fatty acid intake has come up uh, over the time. I don't think that's been a reason why we have low omega-3. Um, and we can talk about omega-6 later if you'd like to. Uh, but the at this point, um, again, if you, if, if, you've, if you don't eat fish very regularly, you're not going to have a high omega-3 level. It just doesn't happen. What's the relationship between omega-3s, uh, triglycerides, and generally, you know, these markers like triglycerides, HDL, LDL, how do you think about omega-3 and their influence on those? Yeah, the I think one of the first effects of omega-3 that was discovered, and we were part of the discovery of that in the late um, 1970s, early 80s, was that omega-3s are particularly effective in lowering one of the blood fats called blood triglycerides. So the other one is cholesterol, this is the blood. Uh, Omega-3s don't lower cholesterol, uh, never really have. Uh, and at least in the good, well-controlled studies, you don't see a lowering of cholesterol, but you will definitely see a lowering of triglycerides. And that's because the omega-3s will block the production of those molecules in the liver so they don't get sent out in the blood. So you, you reduce the levels, that's a, a good thing. Uh, then the other things are LDL cholesterol, what, what some people call bad cholesterol. I hate to use that term because it's the bad particles. It's not bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is cholesterol. It's, it's, it's neutral. But LDL particles, which carry a lot of cholesterol, uh, are not affected by fish oils uh, intake. Uh, HDL particles, the good particles, uh, their levels are can be raised a little bit by fish oil. So that's a, a, actually lowering triglycerides helps raise the HDL. They, they're kind of on a seesaw in a way. Uh, so you, you'll definitely see an improvement in the lipid profile, but don't expect to see your cholesterol level go down. If you start taking fish oil. If I know you said it was complicated and it is complicated and on a, but on a cellular level, if you were explaining this to, let's say a sixth grader, an eighth grader, mm -hmm. if we were able to see inside of the body and which we are obviously we have you know we have different medical tools that are, uh, enable that to happen yeah. when fish oil uh, omega-3s enters into the body on a regular basis what's its impact on the cell like what is it actually doing on the cells in our body if we would yeah. try to make it easy to to understand even though i know it's incredibly complicated it's complicated yeah i, I think a, a Reason, there's metaphors, there's analogies for it. Um, I, I think people have often used the fact that fish oil is an oil. Then you think about oil in your car and having enough oil in the engine to, to lubricate all the cylinders as they go up and down. If, you have, if you're low on oil, you're going to have a lot of friction and that's going to create heat. That's going to create, that's like inflammation. Uh, so I think that's one way of looking at it that uh, if you're low on omega-3, you're essentially kind of low on oil uh, and your your cells are going to, there's just going to be friction. There's going to be uh, inability to respond. Like every cell has to respond to the outside environment and it's a very finely, finely tuned, finely designed system. And if, if the cell membrane, which is really the most, almost one of the most important parts of the cell, the membrane, which decides what goes in, what goes out, uh, that is very much dependent upon the, the fluidity of that membrane is important and the flexibility of that membrane. And if you have too little omega-3, the membrane just doesn't operate well. And so you, you get garbled communication between the outside and the inside. And so things just don't go well. Indeed, they definitely don't go well when we especially so many Americans being in that bottom cohort of people that are incredibly insufficient and don't have enough omega-3s. Yeah. Talk to talk to our audience a little bit about EPA and DHA, and let's expand a little bit more from omega-3s top line to going into a little bit more about EPA and DHA and why it's important to understand these two uniquely. Yeah, and let me start with ALA, the, 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 the plant omega-3, which you were very familiar with as a vegan, of course. Uh, that is a form of omega-3 fatty acids. It's such kind of like a, a poor second cousin in a way. Uh, it is strictly speaking, it has the, the right last name. Omega-3 is correct, but the first name is wrong. Uh, 
uh, alpha linolenic. It's a precursor, a poor precursor to EPA and DHA, which can be made from it. Uh, but not very well at all, and you get very low levels. So to get EPA and DHA, which are the two that are in fish oils or in, in marine animals, they actually start in, in the oceans where they're made. To get those two, you really have to eat them preform, meaning in, in seafoods. Um, and great, you mentioned a few of them, salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, anchovies, uh, the, uh, albacore tuna is a good one as well. Um, so those are all great sources of, of EPA and DHA. And EPA and DHA have different roles in the body. They're different chemical structures, uh, very similar, but slightly different. And they are made in, each one of them is made into other molecules by different enzyme systems in the body that have anti-inflammatory or other beneficial effects. Uh, I always think, I, I never recommend that people just take EPA or just take DHA because they come together naturally in fish, always together. They're in fish oils, always together, unless you process it strongly just to remove one or the other. And I don't see any point in that. Um, I, I think the smartest thing to do is get, you know, roughly, you know, 50, 50, 40, 60, percent EPA and DHA in the supplement. Uh, that's kind of the range that it's in fish. And so that's, I think, the best way to go. You touched on it a little bit, but I'd like to come back to it because when I was vegan, one of the things that I would talk about with people, because I was just repeating what I had heard, mm -hmm. um, is that I would tell people, well, there's plenty of animals that don't eat fish and they're able to be successful. Talk to us about why human beings in particular are really bad at converting ALA into the necessary uh, molecules to be able to turn into the same impact that you get from fish or fish oil supplementation. Yeah, that's a great question. So deer and buffalo and parrots and uh, all kinds of other animals don't eat fish, right? <laughs> How do they live? Uh, and it, it, it's a reasonable question. And why is omega-3 so important for humans and apparently not for horses, which are, you know, vegetarian, vegans? Um, <coughs> and to tell you the truth, I never thought about that. Uh, it's a great question. And how you answer it, I think every animal is designed, to, you know, most all these animals we think about live in the natural environment in which they were designed to be. Humans are not. We can create our own food. We can transport our own food. Uh, deer and, uh, and uh, you know, ground squirrels don't do that. They're eating the natural environment. They're designed and built in such a way that they have their cells work in given the food that they are, are um, set up to eat. Uh, but humans, we can avoid uh, we eat not just by necessity, we eat by taste, we eat by culture. Uh, and, and again, we can process foods uh, in a way that no other animal can do. And so that has all, I think, led to humans needing or being low in this particular kind of food. You know, you think about the, back to cavemen and what did they used to eat? Um, Fair, a mixture of, of plant and animal for sure. And, they, but they, and they were probably eating fish. I mean, you've got to, if you're going to have a civilization that grows up, you've got to be by water. You have to be by a river. If you don't, if you're not on the coast, even being on the coast is not very helpful because you can't drink seawater. You got to be by fresh water. And there's always fish, always fish in water. And so fish has been there ever since humans ever appeared on this planet. Uh, and they've been part of the diet. And I think that the fact that we've got um, so out of balance now is, is just a function largely of the what food industry can do and produce for our taste. And we'll, we'll whatever tastes good, we go for. It. And if it's cheap, we go for it. So I know that's a, I'm dancing around your question because I no, don't know. No, really that's a great answer. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. And I mean, really, what you're what I fundamentally hear you partially saying and anybody that's read the work of 
Yuval Noah Harari in the book Sapiens understands that there was a concentrated period where the human brain exploded in size. And we were able to do things that our, you know, uh, certain relatively close ancestors in DNA, uh, other species, were not able to do. We were able to tell stories. We were able to do, make tools. We were able to create civil civilization. And a big part of that, at least the going theory is, it was our ability to concentrate calories and not spend so much time digesting raw food all day and leaves and being able to get nutrients in concentrated forms. So if we want to maintain this ability of our human brain, we have to make sure that we did the things that most likely we evolutionary had access to. And it seems that fish was a big part of our diet prehistoric. I agree. Fish was a big part of our diet, right? And learning, and you know, nobody else can handle it, can do fire. We can do fire. No other animal knows how to handle and use fire. And it's uh, it's a huge deal. I mean, we would have no metallurgy. We would have no machinery if we couldn't figure out how to melt metals, smelt ores with fire. Uh, never mind the cooking side of it, too, which opened up, made some nutrients more uh, accessible from foods that we would not otherwise derive the nutrients. So fire maker, it's a big deal. It's a huge deal. You know, if you go to Times Square today or any other public place, Hollywood Boulevard, I'm located here in Los Angeles, and you ask a random group of people, sort of man on the street interview style, and you say, hey, you know, do you eat a healthy diet? You know, the average person comes back to you and says, yeah, yeah, I try to be healthy because everybody has a different definition of what healthy means to them. For one person, it might mean they only smoke one pack of cigarettes a month. For another person, it means instead of having three Coca-Colas a day, they have one and one diet Coca-Cola yeah, a day. Coke. Right, right. Everybody has a different definition. And I've seen the same thing goes with fish. And you've talked about this in your work. You have instrumentally talked about how important it is to both consider fish intake, and especially from the right fish, as well as supplementation. But let's talk about the fish and the dietary side of it. How much fish do we need to be eating if we want to be optimal, which is what my audience and I are looking for? Yeah, right. And the first question is what kind of fish before we talk about, because there is a wide variety of omega-3 richness or lack of, of richness in fish. If you, on the low end of omega-3 in fish, you've got things like tilapia and cod and perch and bass and like a lot of lake fish, um, shrimp, almost nothing there, lobster, almost nothing. Because these are very, very low fat, protein rich type, types of animals, uh, foods. And if there's very little fat, even if 50% uh, of the fat is omega-3, which it's not, uh, if there's hardly any fat there, you don't really get much uh, omega-3 when you eat a serving. So if you, those kinds of fish don't count. Uh, for when we think about uh, telling people we, we mean oily fish. And when we say oily, it's always kind of an odd expression, but uh, people hopefully will realize fish that, that ha are like salmon, like sardines, like mackerel, herrings, you know, and uh, uh, anchovies. I don't know who anybody who eats anchovies straight up, you know, other than maybe on a, on a Caesar salad or on a pizza. Uh, but Anyway, anchovies are very rich in omega-3. One of the good sources of fish oil is anchovy. Uh, so there are certain kinds of fish that are very good, some, some kind that are pointless, useless. Uh, and so when we talk about how much oily fish do you need to eat, if we take salmon as the best example, um, you can get about a gram, gram and a half of omega-3, EPA, DHA, from a standard size serving of salmon. So that's a lot. So if you did that every day, if you ate salmon every day, then you would not need to take any supplements. You'd like be they do in Japan, Korea, you're, you were mentioning. Right, exactly. Right. And not, not that they eat salmon every day, but they, they eat such a wide variety of different kinds of fish, um, including the, the rich oily fish, tunas, things like that. Um, so one or two servings a, 
one serving a day of those kind of things, people usually te- recommend, you know, like the American Heart Association, two oily fish servings a week. I don't think that's enough. Uh, that's that's better than most people can do or do do, but it's not enough, uh, which is why I think we need supplements. We did a study, I think you may be referring to it, uh, looking at uh, the omega-3 index in like 3,000 people that sent in blood tests to our laboratory for analysis. And we asked them, do you take a fish oil supplement? Yes, no. Do you? How often do you eat oily fish as a main course? So those are pretty rough questions. Yeah, I mean, not very precise, but they're not bad. And we found that the only group of people that had a average omega-3 index at 8%, which is we think our target, are people that reported three times a week eating oily fish and taking supplements. So that's a ballpark idea of what you got to do uh, to achieve a optimal omega-3 index. Uh, it can be done all with supplements. It can be done all with fish. I like to see the, the mix myself, and that's, um, that's what we observe. Now, before we get into supplementation, do's and don'ts, and all the things that you've learned around that, I want to just take a moment here to talk about testing. I shared that in my story, I was seeking out and I was open to testing because I didn't feel good. And I've found personally that most people in my life that are serious about getting their omega-3s in the optimal zone are often individuals that have at least gotten a baseline because we can all guess and think we know how much fish we're eating. But then when you get back blood work and a report and it shows you where you're at, it's a light bulb moment that goes off. And another part of that there is that it's not just about and you've highlighted this in your work so often, I've heard you say this on other people's podcasts multiple times, it's not about for one day, one week, one month, getting our omega-3s in the optimal zone, it's getting them in or as close as we can to the optimal zone and keeping them there, ideally over the course of our lifetime. That's where the most protective aspects come from having omega-3s in our diet. So talk to us about testing and some of the work that you guys have done to make this more accessible. How do you get a test? And when you get that report back, what are, uh, what shows up on that report? Sure. Uh, Yeah, the the test that we developed about 20 years ago now, uh, it's called the omega-3 index. Um, It's a blood test. It reports the amount of EPA and DHA that are in the membranes of your red blood cells that circulate in your blood. Of course, half, about half of your blood is water, plasma, and about the other half is red blood cells. Uh, so it's very easy to get samples of red blood cells. And the red cell is a example of kind of a, a, a surrogate for the other cells in your body that you can't get a sample of. Uh, so we like to measure red cell omega-3. Uh, we proposed back in 2004, and we still believe today that a EPA DHA content of 8%, eight, say 8 to 12% approximately, very few people have anything higher. Uh, that range is the optimal range for the omega-3 index. Uh, most people are, like I said earlier, 90, 95% of people are below that 8% in America. Uh, but we think that's it's it's an achievable target. It's a safe target. You can do it with supplements. You can do it with fish. So eight percent is the target. Uh, the way we do the test, uh, some we, we analyze blood for some uh, clinics, doctors' offices, and they send us blood tubes, and we isolate the red blood cells themselves and analyze them. But most of the time, we use the dried blood spot method, where we send a a little kit to your home and you open it up and you've been through this, Uh, clean your finger, poke your finger with a a little lancet, get a drop of blood, put it on a card and put it in the mail and send it back to us and we send you a result. And in that result, we'll tell you what your omega-3 index is on kind of, you know, what standard red, green, yellow scale everybody uses. Um, And we'll give you uh, some suggestions uh, exactly. So if your omega-3 index is, say, at 5%, which is pretty typical, um, we have a calculator on our website that you can link to, 
and put in your 5% index, and then it will tell you how much omega-3, EPA, DHA you probably should try to eat additionally, how much you should increase if you want to get up to 8%. Uh, and that is the that's data we've got from other studies that we've reduced to an equation that says most people who are at five percent need about another thousand milligrams a day of EPA and DHA to get average eight uh, percent. That's a good place to start. So that's part of the report that you get back from uh, Omega Quant, our lab. Um, there are other levels of testing that I think to me that's the most important test to get is the omega-3 index. That's the basic, that's the cheapest thing that we uh, we offer, which is around 50 bucks uh, for that test. And but, but you can, if you want, you can get higher, uh, more information, uh, omega-3, omega-6 ratios, EPA, DHA, excuse me, EPA, AA ratios, trans fat ratio. I think that's kind of important too. Uh, the trans fatty acids are the ones that we don't want to be eating, the ones in donuts and, you know, pastries. And, uh, so we can measure that in your red cells and we report that. Uh, the third level of test is we'll call our complete test, which gives you uh, like around 24 different fatty acids, your blood levels and wh where they rank in uh, relative to the general population where you are. Uh, so that's the, the complete test. But, you know, for my money, you know, the 80% 80, 80 of the bang comes from the omega-3 index. Get that first. That's the most actionable one, um, I think, of, of all of our tests. Yeah. You know, there's this term or this phrase that people use, which is, you know, don't step over dollars to pick up pennies. And I often get asked <laughs> as a podcast host, even though I tell everybody, look, I know I'm Indian. And you think I'm an expert or a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert. I just get to talk to so many of them. But people will ask me, what is the next longevity supplement? What is the next thing that they should be doing? And especially in the last couple of years, as I've had a chance to talk to incredible people like yourself, I'm like, guys, it's not about something new. The basics, if we just did those, which again, I would say 99% of people aren't even doing the basics. That right there is an opportunity to maximize what we already know works in the literature. And omega threes is one of those. So I have no formal affiliation with you, your company. I just want everybody to know I've written about omega quant in the past before. I'm not an affiliate. I'm not anything. I'm just such a big fan because it made a difference in my journey. And the more that I've learned, it's about, as a friend of mine, Max Lugavere says, you want to major in the majors and you don't want to major in the minors. There's a thousand things that we could all be doing for our health, but why not double down on the ones that we know can significantly move the needle forward? So that's why I really wanted to get a chance for you to talk about the company and the testing. And I appreciate you uh, sharing that. We'll have the link in the show notes uh, that's there. Now, great, continue. Great. Thank you. And you're, you're right. I, I just have to echo what you said. Uh, and I love your little, uh, your dollars and pennies thing. I hadn't heard that before. That's good. Yeah, uh, I stole that from somebody. It's, it's so easy to get distracted, but a million little supplements or, I mean, if you look at the big things, exercise is a huge thing. Huge. Huge. And it, if people won't do that. You know, why bother with all the other stuff if you won't even move? Just move. You know, I mean, that's half the battle. Eat less, move more. And that, that solves so many of our problems and take more omega-3. Yes, definitely. And I want to say I have empathy for people who are focused on minor things. I was definitely one of those people. When you get into the world of health and you're not trained and you don't have a background like you and your team do, where you really know how to go through the nuances of the literature and speak with authority, it's easy to get excited about random things that you think will make a difference and that might help other people. And sure, they might've helped you, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be across the board, the biggest thing that moves the needle forward for other people. So I want to go on record that I've gotten things wrong in the past, that I've majored in minor things, and I'm working on recorrecting that and taking my audience along with me. One of those ones has been exercise. I've been on a strength training journey over the last two years since I turned 40 and realizing that I was under muscle. And how muscle is so protective for all aspects of our health, including helping me to improve my metabolic health. So 
I got it wrong. I have empathy for other people who, you know, got it wrong in the past. I did the best that I knew how, and I'm working on correcting that by having people like you on my platform. So thank well, that's you. That's great. That's great. And it's great advice. Good for you. So I want to continue down this story because we talked about the dietary side. We talked about testing. Let's talk about supplementation. But first, again, because I was an individual and I have no problem with people being vegetarian, vegan. I have many, many of my family members, many of my friends. But one of the comments that I often hear from my vegan friends around fish oil is, oh, it's all good. I don't need to get an omega-3 test done or I don't need to be taking fish oil. I'm taking an algae-based oil. Do these algae-based fish products move the needle forward? I actually don't know the answer to that. So I'd love for you to chime in. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, if, if it's an algae-based EPA and DHA, again, I kind of mentioned that the omega-3s are born in the ocean. Uh, and they're born inside the the cell inside the bodies of these single celled what we'll call plankton, zooplankton, phytoplankton, uh, just tiny tiny little organisms that will take sunlight and sugar and make fatty acids, make omega threes, and then they form the basis of the food chain. So some companies years ago figured out which specific species of these little micro. We're not talking about seaweed here. This is microalgae is not seaweed. Microalgae is something you don't eat, uh, but they can be grown in a big vat. Uh, they can be fed sugar. They can then produce omega-3s, and then the company will harvest them and take the EPA and DHA out that they're making and put it in a pill. And it's exactly the same stuff that's in a fish oil pill. So I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is people taking alpha linolenic acid from flaxseed oil or chia seed oil or things like that and thinking that they're getting the good omega-3s when they're not. Mm. Great explanation. Thank you for that. Let's talk about standard fish oil that's there. What are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to choosing the right fish oil? And then if you could remind us again about dosage that generally is regarded as safe for people. I mean, the whole thing is safe, but generally is some dosage that's gonna help most listeners of this podcast start moving in the right direction, even if they didn't test necessarily. Yeah, right. Um, and, and to that point, I think I really wanna recommend people test before they start supplementing, because they're, I mean, it's not the end of the world if you, if you say, I know I'm gonna be bad, I know I'm gonna be awful, so I'm gonna take some pills before I do my test. Fine, you know, and but get some kind of baseline. It, it, it's good to know what what the effect on your body is of the supplement you're taking. And it's also exciting to cut you off. It's exciting to see, wow, I started here. Yeah. And then in a period of time, which is going to be my question after you answer this, I got to here. That's empowering. It's empowering to know that you have agency on your health and that with focus, you can make a huge difference yeah, in, in something that's so key for our health. So let's start with first is 50 bucks, right? Everybody can scrounge up $50 for the most part. We can deprioritize things. We can not eat out one night. And why not dedicate this to your health? So 50 bucks. The test that I think I did was 100 bucks. We included a little bit more information or yeah, 99, yeah. $99 right around there. Either one is a great option to get started on. So testing, and you'll get the recommendations that are that are there. And now let's get into the do's and don'ts around fish oil supplementation. Sure. Uh, first of all, there are several forms. I obviously, you walk into a, a drugstore, a Walmart, a Costco, whatever, and you're going to see lots of different types of omega-3. And it's, it's very confusing to people. Um, I think the most important thing is to look at the label and, and buy the product that's got... Well, yeah, I would say the most EPA and DHA per capsule, <clears throat> those are going to be the most expensive. The, the ones that, I mean, one of the cheaper things like at Costco is something like 1,200 milligrams, it says on the front, 1,200 milligrams of fish oil, but it's only got 300 milligrams of EPA and DHA. So it's only 25% of that pill is omega-3. The other 75% is not omega-3. It's just other regular fats. That's a cheap product because you aren't getting much omega-3. It doesn't take much concentration to do that. I mean, it's not bad. It's better than nothing, obviously. Um, but the ones I look for are the ones that are typically in a triglyceride form 
as opposed to what's called an ethyl ester form. And ethyl ester is the form that most of the omega-3 drugs are in. Uh, and they do that just so they can concentrate the omega-3s in a pill. And, but you don't need to do it that way. I think the triglyceride form is the better form. Uh, another good form is a, a what we'll call krill oil, which comes is a phospholipid form, another natural lipid. Um, and so that's a great source of omega-3 as well. But look for the uh, amount, you know, you want to get, if you're going to aim for, say, a thousand milligrams a day, uh, find a pill that maybe gives you 500 milligram per capsule. So you could take two pills a day and you're going to get a thousand. Um, if you're going to get something that's only got 300 milligrams, you're taking, you know, three to four pills a day. And the more pills you have to take, the less likely you are to take them. Uh, so th those are some of the do's and don'ts. You don't need to you don't need to refrigerate fish oil. You don't need to freeze it. Freezing it is not going to make a burp go away or prevent a, a fishy burp. Um, taking it with food helps reduce that. It's always good to take omega threes with food uh, because it's you get all those digestive juices flowing from the food. Then it helps with the absorption of the the uh, omega three fatty acids. Uh, so that's always a good idea. Um, if you're taking an ethyl ester, you absolutely have to take it with food. Uh, the triglycerides or phospholipid is not so critical, but it's always a good idea. Um, what other do's and don'ts? Um, don't chew them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a bad idea. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. A few follow-up questions on this. Number one is, in a global supply chain, in major categories of food. I've written about this. Olive oil is a prime example. This has happened in honey. Naturally, as many different countries and different manufacturers get into the production of something, especially something that would be considered a premium product, there can be a degradation in sourcing and even sometimes uh, fraud that might be coming into play. We know this is pretty well documented with olive oil, a huge percentage of the world's olive oil is cut with vegetable oil or mislabeled or deodorized agents or other things in low quality oil. And it's not necessarily extra virgin. And there's a bunch of guidelines that are out there on how to find high quality olive oil to maximize the benefits. Is any of that at all, the themes of that, is that at all an issue in the world of fish oil that you've seen in your experience? Not as much, not as much as, as what you're describing for olive oil. Um, it's, it's harder to do that with fish oils. Um, and they're, you know, when, when people do surveys, they, they, they walk into a, a, a big superstore and buy 10 different bottles of fish oil. And then they go home and, an, well, they don't go home. They go to their lab and analyze it for omega-3 content. And they look at, um, the oxidation products, you know, things like that, that are mercury. And by the way, you won't find mercury in any fish oil pill mercury, if, if it's there at all in the fish, and that's pretty rare, actually, um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to go away when they separate the oil from the, the water in the flesh. So the oil doesn't can't have any mercury in it. Uh, but anyway, people will measure omega-3 content in different fish oil types, and then they'll write a paper on it and say, you know, X percent of these met their label claim. Uh, and most of the time, it's they're pretty close to their label claim. They're, they're not far off. There's always variability batch to batch. Um, rarely does anybody have any of the uh, oxidation products, breakdown products. Um, if they do find it, that's what makes news. But when they do the studies and everything looks great, then never gets on the news, of course, you know, because it's not news. It's what you'd expect. So I'm not worried. I, I, you know, I don't go out of my way to get really, really high end, really, really pure fish oils because those are so much more expensive. Uh, and I honestly, I don't see the point because uh, you're getting something. I mean, even even some of the stuff you can get at the big box stores. Um, I, again, I get the higher concentrated forms, not the low concentrations. But th those products don't don't worry me. They they provide the omega threes uh, in a safe and uh, pretty well uh, well standardized form. And you know, it sounds like as an extrapolation of that. And correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I have some resources. A lot of my podcast guests to uh, po podcast listeners 
you know, typically if you're listening to this podcast, there's some resources, you know, you're not fighting for basic aspects of food on the table. You care about longevity. You're willing to reprioritize your budget. Even if you're not wealthy, you're willing to take the things where you previously might be spending money on alcohol or clothes or other things that may not be there. And people are shifting. You see this across the board. They're shifting these resources to health experiences, the basics of life that actually make us feel good and live, live longer. Yeah. So I opt for personally, just like I would choose wild caught salmon. I opt for fish oil that comes from, you know, what is being labeled, whether or not it's the case. I mean, these are companies that I trust yeah. wild caught. And my thinking is that if we're supposed to be eating fish because that's what we're designed to do. And that's one of the things that helps us with our omega-3 and the optimal levels. I would err with caution, even if I know that the omega-3 and the EPA and DHA ratio is equivalent to both, I'd rather be eating fish that are eating what they're meant to be eating in a wild caught source versus eating farm fed fish that are eating a combination of wheat, feed, corn, ground up fish, and maybe other processed foods that are part of feed. That's just what's required that's there. Yeah, but yeah. I feel yeah. like you would say, look, you can do that if you have the ability, but a few caveats. And tell me if this is correct. The caveats is the harder we make it for people, the less likely they're going to do it. And they're going to not end up getting all this omega-3 in the first place. Right. Right. So if it's so hard, if it's expensive, fine by you, Drew, you can eat wild caught. But what about the person who's just trying to even get the basics? Is that your argument? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you look at farm, farm raised salmon, for example, that uh, 10, 15 years ago got a bad rap because it had it was it had high levels of PCBs in them, things like that. That's all been cleaned up. That was that was an you know that was a, a, a wild ex extrapolation of the data anyway back then. But anyway. Farm fed salmon has got about as much omega three as wild caught salmon, because uh, that's how much they feed them. And I, it's it's less than it used to be. To your point, they're starting to feed them other vegetable oils to supplement the uh, the calories uh, that fish oil. And fish oil is getting expensive because of podcasts like this. <laughs> yes, so they can't feed it to the fish. Uh, they're they're finding new ways to make omega threes for fish food, uh, but you know. If you avoid, if you're not going to eat salmon because you can't afford wild caught, you know, coho, and so therefore you're going to eat a hamburger, that's, you're not winning anything. <laughs> you know, buy, buy the cheaper type of salmon or, you know, you canned salmon's great. Uh, albacore tuna is great. Those are good, really good sources of omega-3. Of course, sardines, if any, some people love them. You know, I can't say I'm one of them, uh, but yeah, I think you, you've got to you got to be smart about it and don't let a, a little bit of a downside here stop you from doing the right thing. I mean, that that really plays out, I think, and you haven't asked about pregnancy and omega and omega three and mercury and all that. But the FDA did a huge disservice to American women by telling them to, to not eat more than like 12 ounces of fish because they're worried about the mercury. And that has that has driven so many women, pregnant women, away from eating any fish at all, which they, to their detriment, because the DHA is really important for baby's birth, baby's development. Uh, they're so afraid of a, a whisper of mercury in a fish that they will avoid all the benefits just because they're afraid of that. I mean, we published a paper last year looking at the relationship between cognitive outcomes in babies and kids and fish intake. And regardless of the mercury in the fish, high or low, made no difference. The more fish you ate, the higher your IQ in the kid. And, you know, I've part, I'm a bit of a, I'm not standing on a, my soapbox, but I feel like <laughs> it. Because that, I think, was a real disservice to scare people away. Uh, it, it's kind of the same category you're talking about, scaring people away from something that's really good because of some tiny little risk, whether it's financial risk, your pocketbook, or here in this case, it's it's worried about mercury. Uh, so don't worry about the mercury, eat the fish, eat the oily fish. They are, they're very, very low in mercury anyway. Uh, so. Yeah. 
Uh, we're, thank you for wherever that. we work. <laughs> no, no, no. That was perfect because this is why the audience is here. They're trying to, on their road to a hundred and maybe even beyond, we don't know. Yeah. But more important than that, a true healthy health span along the way, they're trying to separate what matters and what doesn't. They're trying to separate signal from noise. And sure, we can get so deep in the weeds on any particular subject. And there's a lot of people that are out there that want us to get really deep in the weeds. But for most people, they're putting attention into their health and wellness journey and hitting the basics like getting enough omega-3s so that they have enough energy to give love and attention to everything else in their life that matters, including their spouse, their kids, their grandkids, their community, their local church group, Whatever you care about, starting a business, writing a novel, being there for people, community service, we don't want our health to get in the way of those things. And how we do that is we have to put as much of it on autopilot and ease as possible when it comes to these healthy habits. So your soapbox is allowing people to make that decision and say, you know what? I was really worried about this thing, but the truth is how many times did I really actually have fish in the last month? How many times did I really actually consistently take my fish oil supplement? And if I wasn't even hitting those basics, maybe it's time to just double down and focus on the basics. So thank you for your soapbox moment. You're welcome. <laughs> my pleasure. You know, one other thing that you've highlighted in addition to certain at-risk communities, you mentioned women who are pregnant, avoiding fish because concerns around mercury, et cetera vegans who, again, if they're not intentional about supplementation and you cleared up that there are vegan supplements people can take to move the needle forward. You've also mentioned another group that's out there in your work in the past, and that's military uh, groups that are there. Talk to us about that community, which is often an underserved community when we talk about health conversations. What do those communities have to be thinking about uh, you know, because they're not vegan, at least the vast majority of them are not vegan. But why are they at risk for low levels of omega threes inside of the diet? Because of what the military feeds them. That's why. I mean, they, and just to back up, uh, the two groups that have the lowest omega three levels in our experience in our research are vegans and U.S. soldiers deployed in Iraq. Is when we did the study, uh, but it was pitiful how low the omega-3 levels were in those soldiers. And, and you're right, they're not vegans. It's not because they're choosing that. It's just the military is not feeding them uh, a, a healthy diet. Uh, and I know the military is writ large, is, is knows about this, is concerned about this, and wants to do something about it. Uh, exactly what they're going to do, I don't know. They have a, some uh, some kind of aversion to supplements in the military. So people are trying to come up with enriched foods that you can feed to uh, people in the military that will give them omega-3. And those, those products are out there. Um, but it, it's it's been a shame that people who ought to have the sharpest executive function, the best physical shape, the best resistance or, or resilience um, are not being fed optimally. And I'm sorry about that, but it's the way it was. Hopefully it's not the way it still is. But. I feel like there should be a whole campaign. I know I would want to donate to it and my audience as well. Let's get good quality fish oil in the hands of, you know, military and also probably, you know, some veterans as well, too, who have been deficient for extremely right. oh, yeah. long time. Right. Right. And truck drivers and airplane pilots, you know, and people who, you know, you don't want to have sudden cardiac arrest if you're driving a truck or flying an airplane. So if you got another guy in the airplane cover for you. In the truck, you don't. Um, anyway, that's that's a just another little pet peeve of mine that these people that uh, drive these rigs on these highways, pretty crappy hell. Mm, mm. Well, thank you for highlighting that. It's important. You know, those communities are often overlooked and uh, yeah. everybody deserves health. And so hopefully people are listening that can make an impact in those respective uh, communities. And if you do, or you know of an initiative, reach out to me, we'll feature it on the podcast. Cool. Uh, one thing about fish oil that I wanted to come back to, let's say, you know, you have a 40 year old male um, who is, or female, right? And, and you're around that age and you've not been intentional about your fish oil. You've not been intentional about getting fish in the diet. You're not vegan, but you're on the lower end 
of the Omega index that's there once you test. Yeah. Can you give us some version of a range um, that if people were being reliant on fish oil primarily, you know, they're still eating the same amount of fish, but maybe they're not going crazy on eating a lot more fish. How long could it typically take knowing that every person's different, their chronic stressors, their inflammatory load, these all could play a part in it. But how long have you typically seen it take somebody to now start to work their way towards, uh, you know, the, the, at least the direction of optimal and then optimal? Yeah, yeah. Well, we typically say that if you're going to start to move your needle, uh, and again, I say, pick an example, omega-3 index of five, and you want to go to eight, that takes about a thousand milligrams a day. And it takes, it will take you about three to four months before you will actually hit a new steady state where you, it's going to be going up slowly, slowly, slowly as the red blood cells get incorporated with omega-3 takes time. Um, but then after, after around three or four months, you're going to be where you're going to be. And that's the time to retest, to see where you are at that point, uh, to see what how well you absorb the, whatever product you're using. Um, is it really working for you or not? Or do you need to take more or, or not? So I, it, it's really, it, it's, we're not talking about years. We're, talking, we're not talking about days. We're talking about uh, three or four months. So 1,000 milligrams a day from fish oil, right? That has an equal right. balance of around 50-50 or 40-60 EPA yeah. DHA. 1,000 milligrams a day. And then retest after a four month period to see how you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I think it will, so many people miss the point. They see a thousand milligrams on a, ca on a label of the fish oil pill, not realizing that that's the fish oil, that's not the omega-3. Right. right. You need to look at the label, see how much omega-3 EPA DHA you're getting and take then get a thousand of that, which might take 3000 milligrams of fish oil to get 1000 milligrams of EPA DHA if it's a cheap product. Once somebody has moved into the optimal category of their omega-3 index, and again, you can test for that, link in the show notes, what are the recommendations there to stay there? Knowing that we're all dealing with all sorts of different stressors, especially as we age, our sleep patterns change, our body composition, changes, you know, uh, women who are going through perimenopause, menopause, there's all sorts of different stressors that are there. Yeah. Is the recommendation to stay at a thousand or for those high achievers or those teachers pets that are out there that want to really double and triple insure on something like omega three, is there any benefit or recommendation to bumping that up over the years? Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah. Uh, first of all, just because you get up to a thousand, up to a 8%, by taking a thousand milligrams, uh, it ain't going to stay there if you stop taking it. It's going to. That's number one. Number one. Yeah. So you can't. You're not. You're not getting cured of low omega three by taking a bunch now and fixing your level. Everything's turning over all the time. So you got to keep going with it. Whether you need to be at nine percent, ten percent, eleven percent, twelve percent omega three index, we don't really know. Um, there is some, partly because there are so few populations or people around the world that have levels that high, we really can't study them. It's hard to, you know, you got 20 people that have an omega-3 index of 16. What are you going to do with them? I mean, you, you can't do a big study on those folks. Uh, so, I mean, there's some evidence from Japan that even within the Japanese framework, having an omega-3 index of, say, 11%, 12%, uh, is associated with a little bit lower risk of cardiovascular disease than having one at eight, seven or eight percent. So I think there's some evidence that higher is better to a point, uh, but I don't see any point going behind above 12 percent uh, omega-3 index. So anywhere eight to 12, I think would be great. You know, back to your point, you know, let's let's just get up to eight first. That would be great. If you can do that and maintain it, that's spectacular. Uh, if, if you want to be in the top 1%, then you can push it if you want to. But uh, I'm not going to guarantee you're going to get any more additional benefit above the 8%. This might be an annoying question to you, and you could say skip, and I'll cut it out of the podcast. Do you share it all where you stand on the index? And do you share it all? Because I'm sure people ask you, how much fish oil do you take on a daily basis? 
Yeah, in no, addition to the fine. fishery. Yeah, my omega three index the last time I measured is around ten percent, kind of in that zone. Um, we use my blood here at the laboratory to, uh, you know, we, we always run a high and a low control on blood of omega three. So mine is the high, and I got to keep it high. Uh, just for the business to keep going. Um, no, it, it's good. And uh, I do about 1,400 milligrams a day of EPA and DHA. Uh, two pills, 700 milligrams each. I, um, I don't eat fish as often as I should. You know, I think everybody says that. I, I try to eat, you know, once or twice a week, I'll eat salmon. Uh, I, I, I wish I did more, but, one, you know, grandchildren, life, you know, gets in the way. Um, so that's kind of what I do. Are, is, can you be too young for a parent to inquire about your omega index? When you're thinking about how important it is for women and pregnancy and the IQ of a baby's brain, do you recommend that parents or grandparents who are listening that want to have the healthiest child possible, do you recommend that they look at the child's omega-3 index? Well, we, we recommend that pregnant women look at their, we, we have a, 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 at OmegaQuant, we have a test called the, uh, it's a pregnancy test. It's, it's uh, DHA specific, not EPA and DHA, DHA specific, red cell DHA. And that level we target is 5%. Above 5% is good. And this is, it, it's probably, even better above 5%, but we set this 5% target for pregnant women based on evidence that women above 5% um, don't have an increased risk for premature birth. So premature birth is kind of a big deal now with the omega-3. Low omega-3 does predispose, below 5% predispose. I mean, it doesn't, it's no guarantee by any means, but they're higher risk for premature birth uh, under that 5%. Uh, so that's pregnant women, babies, children, uh, not much experience there. Uh, people have not done many studies to where that would inform you as to what is a healthy, what's the, the optimal level of omega-3 index for a five-year-old. I don't know. I, 8% is not going to be bad. 6% is going to be great. Uh, you know, I'd probably aim for something like 6% in a kid. Um, just to get started early in life. But I don't know, I, I can't point to evidence for that. That's just a gut feeling. Um, but I would not necessarily feel like you have to push an 8% target in a, in a five-year-old or a, a, even a 10-year-old. Um, but if you can get them used to taking, get, either eating fish optimally or taking supplements, it's going to be better for them in the long run. You know, almost all the research we do is adults. And so that's where we have our experience. You know, Bill, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, as we're winding down here, you know, 40 plus years of research in this area, an entire company that you've built that has really highlighted and put the importance of omega-3s on the map, 340 plus papers on omega-3s. I've heard you say in a previous interview that you're really doing your best to try to get the medical community to wake up to this. You know, people who are listening to this podcast are like, okay, so this individual who seems extremely smart and obviously knows what he's talking about, why isn't every doctor asking me or testing my omega-3 levels. If we have so much information about how important omega-3s are, right. why is it not part of the standard practice of care for regular doctors to go and order this on a normal blood panel and talk to their patients about the importance of fish in their diet and as well as fish oil supplementation if they need it? Yeah, it, that's a, a persistent goal of mine and a persistent frustration of mine. Um, and I sense it in your voice as well. Uh, there, if, if, if you could just get the medical community, whatever that is, to see this data and realize, put two and two together and say, we really ought to be testing. That's why we formed Omega Quant in the first place, was to have a test available for doctors to use. Because uh, there was nothing 
back then. And now there are some uh, big labs will offer omega-3 tests. That part of the complexity of this is they aren't measuring red blood cell omega-3, they're measuring say plasma levels of omega-3, which is a different number and a different target value. Um, and there's, it gets confusing for doctors if there's two or three different ways of expressing the omega-3 status and they don't know which one is the right one. And they go, oh, just, just, you know, eat a healthy diet, you know, and take these pills or take these drugs, right? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's been a challenge. I, I suspect the day will come when it eventually uh, reaches the level of making, make it into the, res the uh, recommendations of um, particularly primary care uh, doctors that they measure it. Vitamin D got in there. Vitamin D is measured commonly, and it's not because we're worried about rickets. It's because it, uh, there was so much noise about it, and, and there was an easy test with one answer, not four different ways of expressing like vitamin D levels. With omega-3s, there are multiple ways of expressing it, and it's confusing. So that's, that's a, a strike against us, I'm afraid. Um, we like the red blood cell-based metric. Uh, we, we think it's it's the most stable, steady, long-term measure compared to plasma. Uh, but even if you if you go to a doc, some of your labs, uh, like the big LabCorp, uh, Quest, they will do omega-3 testing, but it'll be in, in a plasma and you get a different number. But that's better than nothing. And it's a step in the right direction. But I, I am frustrated that we can't get a uniform endorsement for omega-3 testing uh, in, in the in the medical community. Well, it's through the work and effort. Anybody who studies even a little bit of history, especially the history of medicine and the major advancements, they know that so much of what has kept us healthy today that is now taken for granted came from years, decades, sometimes centuries of researchers, continuing to do the work and sounding the alarm. You mentioned trans fats earlier. Right. We wrote a whole right. profile on Fred Kumaro <laughs> and his work that took decades for decades. It's trans fats are now for the audience that's following along that didn't see this newsletter. Trans fats are known to be the most damaging fat that's out there. Their toxicity level, their association and connection to cardiovascular disease, like it's so clear and we had the literature, we, the larger collective, we, the researchers that were doing it, and it took years for the FDA, for people to pay attention and finally outlaw it. And even now still there's workarounds and ways to kind of get hidden trans fats that are there. Right. And I see you, Bill, as somebody, you and your team, as being those individuals that are um, fighting to make sure that this is no longer something that people have to hear about on some random podcast that's out there, but it's something that's baked into their medical care. And to that, our entire country and the world really owes you and me on a personal level, owe you a huge debt of service. So oh, thank you for your work. You're kind. I appreciate it. And uh, th thanks for this chat. It's been a lot of fun. Bill, where can people go to continue to follow you and your work and also your daughter's work too, right? It's a family business as well. Is that understood? Yeah, she's she's a PhD in nutrition, like I am, and she's she's very involved with the kind of early life, pregnancy, early you know early development stuff. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun having her on board. Um, staying in touch with OmegaQuant.com, or or I've, I've started a uh, research organization called the Fatty Acid Research Institute. Pretty clever name. Uh, and Fari, F-A-R-I, um, people can find stuff about me there too. I, I'm bad at the, uh, standard social media stuff. These days. I just, I don't know, just, just haven't gotten into it, you know, posting every other day is something I'm doing. Uh, but anyway, those two websites, uh, Bill at Omega Quant is my email. People want to contact me. That's fine. Happy to respond to questions, do it all the time. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of how you contact me. Well, Dr. Bill Harris, thank you again. Thank you for your work. Thank you for making a difference in my life. We'll have a link to all those 
uh, items you mentioned in the show notes. Please, audience, go get tested. If you care about longevity, this is one of the things that's going to help you move the needle forward. It did for me. And thank you again, Dr. Bill Harris, for being on the podcast. Thank you, Drew. Enjoyed it a lot. Best of luck. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. If it was only about the calories, then glucose and fructose would be equal in terms of how the mitochondria would handle them, but they are not.